Just the thought of painting mountains keep you awake at night. Do you have night terrors? Do you fear the pallet knife? And why are the minions laughing at me? <laughs> All yet true. Who on earth was that? Well, hello and welcome back to the studio. Love the below them. Pallet knives. Some of us really never get to grips with them, and some people actually avoid ever using them for painting, but they're incredibly useful. But sometimes they really just stop us painting what we want to paint. And I know that mountains are something that people want to try and master, and if they can do it without a pallet knife, well, maybe all the better. So I thought, let's take a Bob Ross classic. This time, Hideaway Cove, and I'm going to paint it with a brush. That's right, all the way through. Well, almost all the way through. I do mix my paint with, with a palette knife, and I do do a couple of water lines, but really you could substitute a liner brush for those. So, let's get on with the painting. Hideaway Cove, a Bob Ross classic, and no fear of a palette knife. So here's my canvas, 16 by 20. And the first thing I have to do is work out where I'm going to have the horizon line. I'm going to use a couple of these map pins. I want them to be around about a third of the way up from the base. Certainly lower than halfway. I'll put one in this side and one in the opposite side. I'm going to start my canvas with this. Some Bob Ross liquid white oil paint. I keep some in a small airtight container for ease of use. And I've got an old Bob Ross one inch brush. And I'm going to apply a very thin even coat to the entire canvas this time. Make sure you scrub it in very well over the entire surface. You don't want to apply too much though. If it's too wet, the painting will become very slippery and it'll be difficult to make our colors stick. I always do a fingertip test. Each fingertip should have a tiny amount of liquid white on it, but not too much. I want to use this brush again, so I'm gonna dry clean it on a piece of paper towel. It's amazing how much liquid white lurks in the bristles. That would have got me into trouble. Here's my palette. And as you see, I set out just a few colors. The first one I'm going to need is cadmium yellow. Now this isn't a particularly strong color and the liquid white will soon make it dull. Here you see my first application looks, well, barely anything really, it's very wishy-washy. Let's add a little more. That's better. The next color is going to be some bright red. And if this is too weak, well, it'll be overwhelmed. So don't be afraid to put on a little extra cadmium yellow. Of course, I want some water in my painting. So I'll be pulling this in from the edge with long flat strokes. Now, top tip, don't leave this area blank. Add a little cadmium yellow to it. My next color is bright red. and I'm going to brush mix this on the palette. It makes a particularly nice peachy orange color. One of my favorites. Make sure you work this well into the brush. And I'm gonna apply this above and below the cadmium yellow on the canvas. Notice I used little crisscross strokes. I don't want any hard edges here. In fact, I want to encourage you to spend more time blending your skies. There's nothing worse than finishing a day's painting, standing back and seeing a deck chair stripes. My final colour is lavender and for this I'm going to need a good amount of alizarin crimson and a very much smaller amount of thalo blue, about five to one. Mix this well, don't leave any thalo blue unmixed, it'll really get you into trouble with your painting. Here you see my colour, maybe a little too crimson for my taste but let's give it a try. I'm still using that old brush, I gave it a dry clean I'll put a little bit up in the corners. I think it needs a little adjustment. I might add a tiny bit more blue into my mixture. One more top tip. Don't blend too deeply into the sky. The closer you get to the yellow, the more chance there is you're going to get a patch of green. So take care. Here you see, I adjusted my color slightly to the blue side. I'm testing it down here in the water. I think I like that slightly more than I like the color on the other side. I'll just blend them all together though. It'll still work out fine. I 
I need a good strong dark underpainting colour for my mountain. I'm going to gather all of the lavender colours I made. Taylor blue, crimson, some Prussian blue, black and some Van Dyke brown. Add them all together and make one lovely dark colour. Sort of a, a charcoal grey colour. I think that's about right. I tidied my palette as well. Time for some planning. I want the peak of my mountain to be approximately one third from the right hand side of my canvas and just a little below that sort of lavender colour in my sky. So this is going to be the top peak of my mountain. I'm going to add several more peaks on the left hand side and maybe one on the right hand side. It will become a bit more obvious once I start blocking this in. Top tip, check and see how wet your canvas is. If it's too wet, you're going to have trouble making this mountain stick. So you can run your finger over it just to scrub off some of the surplus paint. Now, take one of my filbert brushes and load it very well with that dark base colour. I'm going to block in the shape of my mountain. Notice I use my brush more like a sort of a soft palette knife. I don't want to lay on a lot of paint, but I want it good and dark. As I add this colour, the shape of my mountain becomes a little more obvious. But top tip, not too many peaks. It can get a little crowded up there, so I think three or four is about right. I'm just using what's left of my brush and I'm just scrubbing in some colour down to the horizon line. Keep most of the dark colour at the top. Now, notice how I use my brush to shape the mountain. By just angling the brush and sweeping out to the edges, you can almost see a mountain appearing. Remembering that the light comes from the left and there'll be a dark shadow on the right. This is one of my favourite stages of the painting. Just laying out the design. I'll finish up my mountain using that old one inch brush just to sort of soften up this lower edge. Whoops. Oh well, I'll live with the pinkish colour. I think it'll work out quite well. Now for the highlights. I've put out a small amount of titanium white. Take a little drop of that. A touch of red. Maybe a touch of the mountain colour. And even a little bit of Prussian blue. I want a sort of lavender colour here. But to the blue side. This will be my shadow colour. For the highlights. I take white. A tiny touch of red. Maybe a touch of dark sienna. I want a sort of a pinkish tone. Don't over mix the colours. Leave them marbled. I'm using a second clean dry filbert brush. Notice I load it very well with the highlight colour. I think I'll start with this side first. Groom the brush thoroughly. Get plenty of colour on there. Hold the brush with a very, very delicate touch. Barely any pressure on those bristles. And just let the brush drag. The sticky dark underpainting. Grab the colour it wants from your brush. If you pick up any colour, wipe it off on a paper towel. With a little practice, you can lay down colour without picking up almost any dark base colour. Again, remember where the light's coming from. I want to do the brightest highlights at the peaks of my mountain. Also try using your brush on its side and dragging it at an angle. It gives the same effect as watching the paint break on a palette knife can give you a lovely textured finish to your painting. I wipe my brush and add a little of the shadow colour to it. This might be a little on the pale side, but we'll see. We'll try it first. Remember, you're dragging now over to the right into the shadows. If this colour is too bright, then you can always tone it down. I'll just let it pick up some of the base colour. I think that will give me a nice effect. Top tip, stand back often. You really can't see how your mountain's forming when you're sitting right on top of it. Stand well back, that's it. Get out of your chair or stand away from it. Look at it from the other side of the room. Here you see, I'm building up more highlights and shadows on my mountain. The more I do, 
the more 3D my mountain looks. I think just a small amount of shadow in this area will finish it off. But what happens if you overdo it with the shadows and the highlights? Let's show you a really easy fix, and one that I use often on my own work when I'm having just a bit too much fun. I've gone back to the original dark colour on my filbert brush, and just along this ridge line, I'm going to reintroduce some shadow. A few touches just to break up that straight line. And just like magic, my mountain is recovered. One last touch of super bright highlight on this main peak. And a little touch here. Notice how it really makes my mountain pop. I dry clean my old one inch brush one more time. I'm going to use it just to mist out the bottom edge of my mountain with a few upward strokes to bring it all together. A finished mountain and not a palette knife in sight. I want a few fir trees at the base of my mountain. I don't want to waste this colour. I gather all my highlights and shadows and darken them down slightly. A little touch of crimson. I think maybe just a little bit more of the Prussian blue colour. Maybe even a bit more of the mountain base colour. I'm looking for a sort of a deep lavender tone. Something that will stand out from the base of the mountain. I'll blend and mix my colours and try them several times until I get one that I think is going to work. Now, use a fan brush. Go through the paint both sides and give the brush a nice little wiggle. I want to bring the brush together to make a chiselled edge. I add a few little dabs of paint just to reinforce the position of the horizon line. Now, for a little planning. You know I like to plan my paintings. These markers will stop me painting too high up and covering up the misty area at the base of the mountain. It also stops me painting them too regular. I don't really want to be painting a fence. I want them to be nice and up and down. Now I swung my camera over to one side and you can see all I'm doing is I'm tapping and letting the brush skid. I make sure they're nice and upright here, although they look a little bit of an angle. It's all to do with the position of the camera. Is a nice close-up for you. That chisel brush, just touch and let it skid. I'm looking to make a whole forest of trees here. Vary the sizes. Some taller, some shorter, some lighter and some darker. I dry clean my old one inch brush one more time and now as Bob would say, beat the devil out of it. Introduce a nice misty layer at the base of these trees. Really pounded it finish it off with a few little upward strokes. I want to think also about putting in some reflections. Not so much paint on my brush this time. Just make them roughly the same size above as below the waterline. Finally, firm pressure. Push and pull straight down with that old one inch brush. Try not to go over them too many times. They just get too blurred. Once I pull them down once, I'll dry clean my brush and then brush gently across. Now, use your palette knife. Just press or tap into some of that titanium white paint and it doesn't need to be particularly clean. Use firm pressure just at the base of those trees. Really push. Notice how my knife is bending into the canvas and slide the knife along. I want just a little trace of colour here. I'll add a little bit more paint and maybe even make it look like a little snowbank, but very distant. Just soar into the canvas. This is a small detail, but it gives a nice finish to the background of my painting. And if you really don't like the palette knife, you could have done all of this with a liner brush. So my background palette knife free mountain is come out rather nicely. I like the effect. It looks a little different, a little softer than a palette knife mountain, but I think the effect works really well. The only time I used a palette knife, of course, was on those water lines. And you could use a liner brush if you really wanted to. 
time now to move on to the mid-ground and foreground and this is all about fir trees and using a fan brush. There's lots of fir trees here so this is again another great bit of practice work for a beginner. Sit tight, let's get painting again. I've tidied up my palette, moved that lavender to one side. Now I want a nice deep green colour. I'm going to take all of that dark base mountain colour, sap green, salo green, Blend it all together. I'll even add the crimson and the Prussian blue. As long as I get a nice deep foresty green colour, that's all I need. Perfect. I dry clean my fan brush and go straight into that dark green colour. And once again, I load both sides of the brush, bringing it to a chiselled edge. I want to think about the riverbank being at a slight angle. I want it to sort of go up slightly. So it sort of takes your eye into the distance. It's a neat trick. Now, I know you think I've lost my mind. I'm painting four equal sized trees. But this is a perfect painting for beginners to practice. So let's practice fir trees. I'm going to start by painting some upward facing branches on my tree. So angle your brush with the handle slightly up. One corner and just press 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 don't let the brush slide don't flip to a different corner it's a slightly easier angle for you to see what i'm doing now sometimes you might just want to do the center line of the tree first just pressing upwards then come back in and add a few nice outward branches nice clearly defined branches work best i find but they're all too even it looks more like a, a cone rather than a tree. Here you see I'm pressing with the corner of the brush slightly downwards. It gives a slightly different looking fir tree. I'll go back over this one and add some bigger outward branches. But remember, this is just a place to play. So little mistakes like that don't really matter. Now, let's turn our practice trees into the real thing. I'm going to add some new center lines here. Above and between the practice trees. My trees today have got nice upward facing branches. As you saw, I just go in with the corner and press upwards. Sometimes I do the whole tree in one go, and sometimes like this one, I just do the center line. Try both styles of painting fir trees and see which one suits your style best. Time for some reflections. I sort of knocked off some of the surplus paint from my fan brush. I don't need too much down here. I just want a rough idea of where the reflections will be. And notice just how rough they look. They're nothing too accurate here. They just have to be roughly the right sort of shape in roughly the right sort of position. So don't get too worried about them. My old one inch brush has been dry cleaned one more time. Gosh, it's worked hard today, but it's working well. I press straight down, dry clean it one more time and then brush across. Once again, don't overdo it. I'm going to use my fan brush again, but I need to give it a bit of a dry clean, but don't get it too clean. I want some of that dark green color to tint my cadmium yellow. Now pay careful attention how I load the brush. I blend my color and then I push back into the paint to get a little ridge right on the edge of the brush. The idea is that when I come up to my canvas, I'll hold my brush at a slight upward angle and just touch the sticky dark green underpainting. The highlight color is right on the edge of the bristles. I barely need to touch the canvas. Now, I realize later on that you can't really see that very well on the video. So I've lightened my color slightly. I put a little tiny touch of titanium white into it. Once again, I load the very edge of the brush. Now, I'll try adding a second highlight. This can be a bit tricky sometimes because, well, there's always a chance that you'll become a mud mixer. But with a little care, I can add a few little sparkles of highlight here and there in some of the darker areas. In Bob's original painting, he used a one inch brush to paint some nice bushes at the base of these trees. Problem is, there isn't enough room on my little painting, so I'm going to use a filbert brush instead. 
Notice how I pull the brush one direction through that paint and give it a little press. Let's have a look at that in close up. Yes, you can see how I've managed to splay the bristles apart, gentle pressure, and I'm going to use this just to dab on some paint. With care, I can make some lovely stippled effects look just like little bushes on the far riverbank. Save a little dark here and there and paint one little bush at a time. I'll even give them a little reflection. You'll note that I didn't put in reflections at the fir trees. I wanted to save it for this stage. Now, super gentle with that one inch brush. So gentle, barely touching. A brush across and my reflections are finished. Time for a waltz line. I'll tuck this in just in the shadowy area where the bushes meet the water. Here's a neat little trick. If your fir trees look a little stumpy, just take the clean palette knife and slide them up the center of the tree. It gives them a nice point. You can even sneak in a few little extra trees in between the big ones. It's a great way of making half a dozen trees look like 20 or 30. For my foreground, I want a nice big fir tree. I want to make sure this really stands out. I'll make it taller than the mountain or the trees on the left. And it really brings it forwards in the painting. Just as before, I drop in a nice center line. I load my brush well with that dark green mixture and using upward pressing strokes. Wasn't it lucky I didn't put too much highlight where I knew that tree was going to live. Time to paint some one inch bushes. I'm gonna use my old one inch brush. Notice it's got a rounded side and on the other edge, it's got this sort of folded crimped area. I always want to load my brush in one direction and by habit, I load rounded side first. Notice how when I pull it through the dark color, I'm pulling rounded side and it kind of creates a sort of nice curve to the top of the brush. Rounded side to the top now and press and let the bristles spring apart. Don't let the brush slide. It looks very different. You notice how when I press, I get this lovely speckly effect, lots of texture. If I let the brush slide, it looks well, more like grass. This has no texture and is very hard to highlight. So now you see the difference, like this and not like this. I'll do a little repair and fill in the rest of the corner using that pressing action to create lots of lovely texture. For good highlights, you need a brush that's in good condition. Once again, I'm gonna use the rounded side first to load the brush. Paint in just gently pulling through the paint. This highlight paint is soft and oily. And if you push it too hard, it just disappears up into the center of the brush. I want the paint sitting right on the tips. Once again, rounded side to the top. Think about the left side of the tree being highlighted first. Gently, gently now. You just have to offer the brush to the painting. The sticky dark textured undercolor grabs that paint and gives you a beautiful, delicate highlight. No pressure, just gently touching. As you see, I've taken off all the highlights. I picked up a little shadow color, so I'll gently touch that off on a piece of paper towel. This will help you keep your highlights sharper and brighter for longer. But there's trouble on the horizon. After several bushes, it's always a chance that your brush is going to get clogged with paint. That's exactly what happened here. Notice how my highlights are no longer delicate and lacy, more like big thick thumbprints. Not good. The solution, remove the highlights. Don't keep adding more color on top, they just won't stick. I'll re-darken the bush using my one inch brush once again, rounded side to the top. Dab in the dark, make it nice and textured and sticky. Dry clean my one inch brush, get it back in condition. And then once again, 
delicate highlights. Keep your brush in good working order and make sure you don't do this. Oh, look at that. Four or five nice thumbprints there. See if I can sneak in a little highlight in between and break it up. After that near miss, all I have to do is add a few highlights to my fir tree. And of course, the classic scratchy sticks and twigs with the point at the palette knife. For a final touch, let's add some grasses. I just use the edge of my palette knife, just press into the paint and let it slide. And with those final details, I think we have a finished painting. It's a Bob Ross classic, Hideaway Cove, and a mountain painted without a palette knife. So there you have it, my version of the Bob Ross classic, Hideaway Cove, a mountain all painted with filbert brushes. But don't move, there's another lovely paint coming right along where I paint a mountain with a palette knife. Happy painting people, don't have nightmares. Does the thought of painting a mountain... <laughs> Thought of painting. <laughs> Shit.